Hello, everyone, and welcome to Overexposed, the BWRM podcast where we delve into the ins and outs of running a real estate photography and videography business. My name's Dave Temple. And my name is Jackie Kirk. Today's guest is one of our founding members, a father of four, and owner of one of the biggest businesses in our network. Welcome, Liam Madden. Thank you for having me. So, Liam, just for our listeners, where are you based? So, I'm in Sydney, and those of you that know Sydney, I'm based in, I live in Lane Cove. And my area sort of goes Lane Cove through Chatsworth to the lower North Shore to the lower sort of half of the northern beaches. So a really nice, quite lovely area of Sydney. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you very much for making time to chat to us. Obviously, you're very busy and it's spring. How How's spring going for you so far, six days in? Ah, it's funny, yeah, six days in. this uh, The six days have been okay, but we've actually had a very good run in to spring. Uh, I do think it's going to be a quite a good spring for everyone. I noticed that through the agents that you don't hear from very often are starting to send through an email or two just to book in a job. So I think it's starting to kick off. Yeah, I kind of find that a pretty good indicator is often you get kind of the quieter agents booking jobs, but also you see, I don't know if it's the same for you, but you see your calendar filling up much further in advance. Like instead of the week before, you kind of have three weeks before Absolutely. the job's coming in. Are you finding that? We noticed that with July, for example, the lead up to the school holidays, a week or two before the school holidays, they were booking in for the first Monday back and we're actually almost booked out sort of two weeks ahead of time, which is very unlike unlike us. And just um, just for the benefit of everyone else, Liam, because you, you're obviously saying we, um, how many people are involved in your business and, uh, and sort of how many jobs would you be doing um, in a month on average? Okay, so we have, so when I say we, there's myself, <clears throat> uh, I do everything in terms of photos, floor plan, video. And then I've got Meg, who looks after the PA, the back end of it. And then I have two photography and floor planners. I have one uh, videographer who works with me, not full-time, but is available full-time. And I have three copywriters. And I think that's about everyone. And I have someone starting next Monday with me, permanent part-time. And I also have the wonderful Carla, who's currently on maternity leave, who does two days permanent part-time with me as well, and we're deeply missing her. So that's a pretty big team. How many jobs a month are you guys roughly doing? So we do nowadays. It is it is hard to see coming out of COVID and that kind of stuff to get a, a good average. But on average, we'd be looking at 100 is a good month for us. And last month, we did 160. So somewhere between there. How are you feeling after last month? <laughs> well, to be honest, pretty good. Um, I've got a great team. Like we, we were busy. And then if I look at this month, we're pretty busy, but it feels quite, kind of cruisy after the month before. So yeah, we're surviving. Awesome. That's great. And on top of all of that, kind of from a family perspective, four kids, four pretty young kids, a wife that's also working full time in a pretty demanding job. How do you guys, how do you manage that? We manage that by my wife being incredible. Um, she does I, – I, like this job is a great job for that. I'm able to do um, a lot of this, you know, the after-school activities and before-school activities and then I sort of, you know, we put the kids to bed and then I get stuck into a bit of work once they're in bed. But uh, my wife, honestly, she keeps every, she keeps us on track and I just kind of do as I'm told. I check my diary and I make sure I'm where I need to be when I need to be and that's sort of with work as well as home life as well. So – Pretty lucky there, though. That's awesome. I guess we could talk a little bit more later on about what it's like running a business the size that yours is, but I'd like to go back to the start. Um, how did you get involved in this line of work in the first place? Yeah, well, I um, I worked for a big photographic company um, called Photocorp, and that was not hands-on camera. That was more managing sort of side of it, sort of sort of the photography side of business. They did um they owned Pixie Photos and Portrait Place and a few school photography businesses as well. And that's where I started, sort of after I left uni. And I, I got a degree in visual communications there in photography. And then I wanted to sort of get into to look at starting like a wedding photography business or more hands on. And I started to grow that business, but it was it was always going to be a lot of Saturdays and a lot of out of hours work. So real estate, I, we actually saw an ad in the paper. Um, and so we looked at doing that and that was a for, for a real estate photography business So on the Northern Beaches. So I sort of got involved with that and then um, moved up sort of from there. And did you have any sales experience from, from the previous work? Or Yeah, a little bit. So when I was working for, for um, 
Buttercorp, uh, there was that was sort of a managerial kind of role. So I had people, I worked with staff, but it was also we did have a sales team, and I learned I learned quite a bit from them. But I was not the point of contact; I was more the customer service side of things. So yeah, so in terms of sales itself, it's always something that's interesting to me, and it doesn't bother me too much. But um, not as full on as as what I you know when I'm the the only person working in the business, having to get the business. That was sort of where it was the biggest sort of leap of faith, and and not something. I, it's it's certainly not something that intimidates me, but it's it is something I need to be. Be in the right mood, I guess, is the right word, or the right motivations at the right time to to really do a good job of it. And what was the attraction of real estate specifically? Was it that you wanted to shoot real estate, or was it that you wanted to be independent? Or no, it was more. um, To be honest, it was the lifestyle. So it's probably one of the only jobs that is technically nine to five, Monday to Friday. There is obviously twilight shoots and all that kind of thing, but it's. Most of that is is between like I've got agents. I always laugh. They, you know, I need first thing Monday morning. So I'll say, you know, what do you want? Eight eight thirty, and they're sort of like, oh, about ten thirty. So you sort of got to, you know, really clarify what first thing in the morning means. But um, yeah, that's kind of the, the sort of the lifestyle we get. So I can still have my weekends for my family. Um, most evenings I can spend with my family. So I, I'm pretty lucky there. It's um, yeah, that was what really attracted me to it. And then the the fact that you can it's scalable. You can then make a business out of it. I've got a team working with me now. So, for example, I just had a couple of days off um, away with my family and extended family. And, you know, my phone rang once or twice the first day and, and didn't ring at all the second day because um, my team had it all covered. So, yes, I've got to catch up on a bit of work now, but it means I can step away from the business, but it still runs without me. And I guess you've also done that. You did that when um, your kids were born as well. You were able to take yes. a good amount of paternity leave, which is still a luxury for most dads these days. Yep. Um, how much time were you able to take off with them? Um, it's hard to hard to remember for each one, but about sort of two <laughs> weeks. A, a week, sort of a week. I think we took. I basically definitely took a week off. Second week was a bit half-hearted, sort of in and out, depending on on who needed me, and then back into it then. But um, yeah, generally a week or two. I'll go away for holidays a week or two at a time, and I would get one phone call every day or two. That is something I they they want. You know, one of the team wants to ask me a question. But generally speaking, I can switch off, and I know they're all over it. So, Liam, you're in a fairly competitive area. I think it's Sydney. It's yep. a very expensive part of Sydney. What would you say when you're walking into offices? What's the point of difference that you've got above, above all these competitors? So it really depends on on who my competitor is. We, so I'm I'm really lucky when I spoke about sales and things like that. I genuinely believe that we our product is great, our service is outstanding, and we do our very very best for each of our clients. So that is where I'm pretty confident going in anyway that I'm not spinning any stories or anything like that. That I am genuine in we will do our very best to make you get the le- you know to get the highest price for this listing and help you get the next listing. I think when I'm up against someone small, it's our size and our scalability. We're able to turn around the next day at a high quality um, versus someone, some of my smaller guys, for example, videos or something might take three or four days to come back if they're lucky and then make changes from there. So my clients are able to go into a listing presentation on the Monday. We're in there on the Tuesday, Wednesday, and they've got a full open home on the Saturday. Or if I'm up against the big guys, they just don't have any customer service these days. Um, They sort of forget about the little guys and all real estate agents need a bit of love and want to feel, not want to feel important, everyone wants to feel important. So we're able to dedicate time to the client. If they want to make changes, if they've got a tough vendor or whatever, we're able to to, to sort of bend our, our packages or services to fit their needs. Awesome. So going back then, you answered an ad in the paper. Yeah. Was there existing business that you went into or did you have to build that business up? <laughs> uh, it was an interesting start. I was told there was there was existing business. So I thought my first sales call should be one of the existing businesses. 
And I rocked in there and I said, hello, is so-and-so here? And they said, oh, he hasn't worked here for about three years. <laughs> so I was a bit of a, a bit of a slap in the face and a bit of a, oh, what have I done? Because I'd left my job and, and everything like that, but I was committed. So literally zero clients. Um, none of the people on the books were, were, we were just their backup or their second or third call. Yeah, it, it was kind of good. Uh, I got, it, I always think sales is a lot of luck involved, but I reckon I got lucky early with, being there, right place, right time, speaking to the right people, saying the right things, you know, someone who just had a blow up with their photographer or just didn't like their current photographer or whatever. So I got very early on, I got quite a few starts um, with a few people, but it was also different, um, kind of showing my age, but I've been doing it since 2010. And so back then, quite often we were having to convince an agent to do professional photography. So it was a bit of a different kind of sales process. It was more you need to do it because the book guy down the road needs it. And there wasn't, probably wasn't too many people of our standard back then. So it was kind of a bit of a, hey, you should do it because everyone else is starting to do it You and you should use us. Um, so that's kind of how we got our start. I joined probably a couple months. I started a couple months before I got married. So it was a bit of a crazy time, but um, yeah, it made it work and it was good. So you built that business up kind of winging it from the sales side yeah i mean i i, I know the ba- I, I as i said with my old job i knew the basics of sales um and it's funny you and i being talkers i know i need to listen more and i still need to listen more <laughs> often it was that it was just stop listen to what they're saying and everyone as i said had just had an argument with their photographer or needed a new whatever so it was just kind of like all right listen what's their problem their problem is their photographer has slow delivery or their their problem is they just don't like their photographer because he's not a nice person or whatever it is. Take it on board, probably give them a free shoot or whatever, and just show them that we're not like them. And then that was kind of our, our main thing. Just to sort of go back and, and give you a bit more credit than you're giving yourself, though, because I felt like over time it's it's just luck. You know, you just happened to be there at the time and you happened to have that conversation. But yep. the fact that you went out and had those conversations is why you – got that opportunity yeah you know so it is all about knocking on doors being in the right place at the right time is about being out there if you'd have sat at home it just wouldn't have happened yeah i genuinely believe though there is like a sales karma god out there (laughs) and i find that like i'll speak with oh let's just say i go out and i meet with 10 people today or whatever and three of them are zero interest at all and me rah rah and i'll just keep plugging away plugging away and then I'll do a big sales day two months later and one of those three will call me being like, hey, we met a couple months ago. I need a job done. And for some reason, I just believe the harder I work in sales, the more luck in inverted commas I get. Yeah. You make your own luck. Exactly right. Correct. Yeah. So you start in 2010. You build up a business. Fast forward to 2016. You left the, the brand you were working with and you had the decision to either go it alone or join BWRM, which was brand new at that stage. Um, talk me through that decision and, and what made you choose to join BWRM instead of, of going it alone. It's a very good question. I reckon it's because I like, like our job is a lonely job. It is like I've got lots of friends who do what we do and we call each other and how are you going, rah, rah, rah. And it's always good to be with other people. I think that was part of what it was. It was more just there's a, because BWRM was brand new as well. So it was kind of like we're all going to be learning this together. So I reckon that was probably more of it. It wasn't nothing in, it wasn't anything in particular, if that makes sense. It was more just follow the group in terms of what, what we're, what they're offering sounds, sounds good. Nothing's locking me in any way. I haven't lost anything in the process, but just being around, like, for example, I think Guy is a fantastic operator. So just keeping those ties with Guy, for example, to be like, all right, cool. What does he do? What's he seeing in the marketplace? And I reckon with – how many people were with us in the start? Maybe four, maybe six. Six, yeah. Four, is it four? Well, I figure there's the directors plus a couple. And I figure we're going to be more um, – better. like if, if the market changes or if a new product comes in or whatever, all six of us will be able to adapt to that better than one of us on our own. So it was more that kind of stick with the network – work with each other, see what everyone else is doing and, and sort of, um, I guess, learn off each other. And in that time, has your business grown significantly? Yeah, significantly grown. I had a 
60%-ish market share in my current, in my areas at the time. So I couldn't get any bigger. I couldn't get any bigger. I couldn't charge any more. I couldn't do much more. Whereas now with BWM, I've got a much bigger area, a much brighter patch, but I've also got the flexibility a bit more. Just in terms of, um, I get to make a lot more of the calls. I get to, I guess, choose who I want to work with and that kind of thing. Whereas back then, you, you had to take what you could get. Whereas now, every agent we work with is great, if you know what I mean. And we enjoy working with them. And I guess they enjoy working with us. I figure we attract those people because we're good to work with. So therefore, you know, they don't take the mickey too much off us, but they know they can count on us. And as a result, like we, had, I, had a, I had someone who was mucking us around the other day, being quite demanding mm. because their vendor was being quite demanding. And the next shoot I had, he walked in, looked me in the eye and said, thanks for putting up with our rubbish. And I was like, oh, great. He knows sort of, he, he understands that he was asking a lot. But as a result now, the next time he asks a lot, we'll, we'll gladly do whatever he wants because he appreciates the effort we put in. So going back to your question, um, I think the advantage of it was I was I have more capital and ex- and and more say in where my money goes, and therefore I can expand. I can bring on staff. I can do all that kind of stuff to sort of help grow the business. So that takes me to my next question, sort of about your goals, because that's another thing we talk about a lot. Is when people join us. We kind of say, what does success look like to you? And we've had people who say, look, I don't want to work with anyone else. I just want to work for myself. Success to me is turning over like two or $300,000 a year. That's enough. What does success look like to you? Because you're pretty much consistently now in the top three of our businesses um, and in the last few months pushing number one. Are you still growing? Are you still marketing? What What are your goals? Absolutely. So my goal, I... I have a degree in photography. I loved it, loved it as a young, young person. But photography is no longer a passion of mine. I love it. I'm, I know I'm very good at real estate, but it's no longer a passion. I actually really enjoy the business side of it. So what I want is a successful, thriving business that I can work. And our job is far more enjoyable when you're only doing two or three jobs a day versus seven or eight, which we've we do and do regularly, but um, the idea is I can step back. We can I can focus and just enjoy the work that I do. But for me, as as we said, I've I've got a family. I've got to look after them, and unfortunately, living in Sydney, it's not cheap. So I also need a successful business behind me. And now I'm hitting the point where I can have a start, have some staff and some teams and all that kind of thing. And I've just noticed, as you said, the business has taken off. I got hit fairly hard in COVID just in terms of growing and that kind of thing, but we're starting to reap the rewards now and hence why I'm bringing someone on next week. And then when Carla comes back from maternity, plus who knows, the more, more the merrier in my opinion, as long as I've got the, the work to give them. So do you have a structure to your sales process? I know that when people are starting out, it's you kind of have time and you can book in your marketing and your, your meetings and things, but what's your kind of sales strategy now? So that's that's the issue with me not having the time is my sales drops. Um, I am very much like a real estate agent that when they they'll, they'll get really busy and they'll be really good at selling and then all of a sudden they sell all the houses and then they've got nothing else to list because they haven't been doing their sales and that happens with me as well. With the busier I get, the less work I put into the sales. So I try to free myself up. Uh, for example, today was a quiet day, so I just called into a few offices and that kind of thing. Just kicked a few tires, showed my face, nothing pushy or anything like that, but just showing my face so that I know when I am looking to hopefully in a month or two bring a few more people on, you know, they're, they're, I'm not just turning up unannounced on their door and they've never seen or heard of us before. And then I have a bit of a structure where I, I love knocking on doors rather than calling. I find I have a lot better success that way. And then from there, I just put them in the diary. Hey, when can I meet you next? What, what do you need from me? And you know, a few emails backwards and forwards, and then hopefully start the relationship from there. Presumably, the fact that you were able to expand the team gives you that freedom. Because if you said you had sixty percent market share before, you would have been yes constantly shooting and and no time to to do any selling before, right? Yep, yep. So with that, when I was at that market share, there was I just couldn't do anything anyway. So a financially, I couldn't really bring anyone on to help me. They just there wasn't enough profit at the end of the day to pay myself the wages I want versus getting bigger. But it didn't matter anyway because I had some big clients that said, Liam, we really like you, but you shoot for the bloke next door and we have no intention of using 
their photographer because we use our photographer as part of our sales process of, hey, our guy's amazing. He only works for us. You know, he's the only one in the suburb, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd really saturated the market and couldn't really get much bigger. So whereas now with a bigger territory and able to service that territory, I'm not necessarily knocking on everyone, every second agent. It's more like every third agent, that kind of thing. That's quite interesting what you talk about of agents wanting to use their photographers as a point of difference. Um, yeah. I've encountered that recently and I have a, a smaller territory and I think I've had a lot of success lately in just the flexibility that VWM offers and being able to work with the editors to come up with a different style and and still offering agents a way to have a point of difference. Absolutely. Even if I am working for their their biggest competitors. Yeah, you nailed that. Which has been, yeah. Massive. Yeah, you nailed that. And that was, again, what BWM can offer is the different styles, the different setups. And that is part of my sales process mm-hmm. too. I talked to them, you know, you don't have to have our floor plan. We can do your floor plans. We don't have to have our style mm-hmm. of video. We can do your style of video. Whatever it is they want, we can now offer yeah. them to, to, to fit them. And that's what sets us apart from our competitors. Yeah, different photography styles. And even just, I remember when I had that specific issue, it's about video uh talking to Lucas and talking to a few other people about what they were doing differently in video. It was just good to have that network of, of shared experience. So you did the sales course, I think it was about a year or two ago, and we spoke about the sales course on this podcast a few times. As someone who'd already had experience, you already knew how to win clients, you still opted into the sales course. Firstly, why did you want to do that knowing that you already knew how to do it? And secondly, did you learn anything? Yes, 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 and yes. Um, yeah, I thought it was great. It's one of those things where it just forced me to rethink my sales technique, tactics, like not tactics so much, but just just how to how to learn off um, a potential client. I did the course, and it was, it was really good because we chatted with other people in the course about you know how we went that week, what we needed to do, and it was really good to bounce ideas off each other. It then meant. You know, by next week, I had to put into practice what we did. So I was kind of motivated to get out there again and meet, you know, meet some new people, knock on some doors. So my sales definitely went up that, in that time, just again, as Dave was saying earlier, just by knocking on more doors, being, you know, turning up. So that certainly helped. And then um, the benefit though was it just gave me a better structure. So I've, I got a new program on my iPad that I take into each one and it just made me think about the sales process put down some questions. So it meant I could ask more intelligent questions. And I have a bit of a journey that I take them on as we're in the sales, as we're chatting about sales with through my questions. But then I can walk out of there and know what they want, what they need. And again, as I said, I'm very confident I can deliver on all that. But it then just gives me a focus of this person is really being let down in this area. How can I show them how good we are in that area and confidently deliver then, you know, when we do a shoot, you know, their first shoot. They're blown away with it, you know, speed of turnaround, just how polite our team is or, or how much fun they have on the shoot or whatever it is. Yeah, we, we, it just gave me that ability to, to learn off them, you know, just in a half an hour meeting with them, that kind of thing. As a larger business now, you mentioned you've got a combination of permanent part-time contractors, staff. How do you work that? What are the pros and cons there for people who are possibly in larger businesses looking to grow? Yeah, so I've done my pricing based on a contractor doing the work and my most expensive contractors doing the work to make sure worst case scenario, I'm still making money. And then essentially I have contractors. I look at my figures more and more, you know, almost daily now on how the month is going, how the quarter is going, how the year to date is going, all that kind of stuff to try to keep on top of that. And that's why I've now brought on a permanent part-time because you look at how much money I've just spent on contractors in the last couple of months and you're like, I know bringing on a permanent part-time is not going to bring them down to zero. But it will at least go sideways, if nothing else. But it will also allow me to, like one of the things I miss about Carla is to get the, the jobs that you don't get paid for. So, for example, keeping our stock footage up to date. For example, going and shooting, there's always construction where we live. So there's always new shops, new streetscapes, new whatever. So we've got to keep updating that. And at the moment, it's me that does that. We've already discussed I'm time poor. I'm looking forward to bringing on the permanent part-time person to get those done in between shoots. And then my goal is to then make my contractors as busy as they possibly can be so I can then bring on a new full-timer, permanent part-time, whatever it is to keep those wages down. So it's kind of now that battle between having enough work for everyone um, but also trying to keep costs down. 
generally speaking, where do you get your part-timers and your contractors from? And what would you say the main benefit for, for them is? Yeah, okay. So quite lucky with um, some of the other teams. So someone, for example, was just I knew their name in the area, was a great worker. Everyone else talked up, you know, said how good they were. They happened to marry someone who went to school with my little brother. I just reached out to them over Facebook and um, yeah, they came on board and they were great. Same as um, someone actually called me just to say, hi, I've seen your name. I'm looking at getting into the industry. So I, at the time, didn't need anyone. And then maybe two or three months later, I thought, oh, I'll give them a call. Met up for a coffee with them. And I'm all about, I reckon I can teach. If you're pretty good at photography, I can teach you how to shoot for us. I'm all about sort of their personality, how they're going to be on site. Do I want to work with this person every day? And that's more important to me than I've got all the best gear and look at my pretty photos. So yeah, so bringing on personality is more important. And then I'm amazed that all of our team will often send me an email, give me a call. Hey, Liam, I just did this or just letting you know X, Y, Z. And it really shows they care. Like they really think about what they should be doing. They don't have to do some stuff, but they'll often do it anyway. And they're the kind of people I want to work with because I can trust that they will do the right thing. So, yeah. And so what would you say from their point of view, is particularly in the case of the competitor that came on board with you, what, what would you say is the benefit to them? So I find everyone who has worked for somebody else that comes over to us, they don't get treated very well. And it's not even like, like I'm pretty sure we pay pretty well and, and that kind of stuff, but they just don't. They, they're almost treated like a just an asset. You know, hey, here's your jobs, go get it done, go do whatever. But I try to reach out to my guys as regularly as possible, have a chat, see them on site, have a conversation. You know, how are you? Is there anything we can do to help? Make sure they've got all their, you know, everything's working for them. Is there anything on our end? Is there any systems we can put in place that would make your life easier? Like all that kind of stuff. And I just think they then enjoy it because some of, most of the people that work with us really enjoy photographing houses. So that's just what they want to do. So the less time they can be in front of a computer uploading at the end of the day or doing paperwork or doing jobs that are not technically their job is um, obviously a benefit to them. So it sounds like a little bit of benefit to them is similar to what attracted you in the first place, which is it can be a lonely job. It's better to be part of a team on the network. Absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. That's a very good way, yeah. Because most of the people are, you know, they were working on their own or they were, you know, just sort of set and forget, just check their diary every morning. Whereas with us, we, we get to sort of share some of the highs, share some of the lows. We'll call each other when there was an interesting shoot, good or bad, you know, have a few laughs and that kind of thing. So, yeah, they, I think they just like being a part of a team as well. Random question for you, Liam, but it's yep. actually one we haven't asked before, but it's one that you and I discussed Here we go. quite often. Yeah. Is... What do you wear on site? A lot of people ask us about uniform versus <laughs> no uniform. I remember yep. Catherine in Queensland, she said originally she was going into into offices wearing branded clothing and just then went in dressed nicely and got a completely like far better result. Yep. But a lot of people ask us, you know, yep. what should I wear on site? What are your fashion yes. tips? <laughs> My fashion tips are when you find a good shirt, buy three or four of them. So you can just <laughs> not need to worry about it. I honestly have I, I always wear a collar. I like my team to always wear a collar. And in my opinion, that's just a respect thing. I believe we're turning up next to an agent who, at a bare minimum, has a business sh business shirt on, sometimes a suit and tie. I don't believe we should be turning up in a in a T-shirt or tracksuit pants or runners or anything like that. We can still be creative, but we can also show them the respect that we have taken pride in getting ready this morning. I mean, I have a little bit of stubble, but generally relatively clean shaven and that kind of thing. You know, your hair's done, that kind of stuff. But I wear either a a polo shirt or a long sleeve business shirt with just some chinos and some sort of casual smart, I, don't know, I guess it'd be dress shoes kind of thing, I guess. But um, yeah, try to be comfy. In summer, I do get the pins out, wear some shorts and that sort of thing, but still a collar. <laughs> because again, it's I got to the point where I was so hot and sweaty, I looked like you know, look like rabble anyway. But yeah, so try to dress as comfortably as possible but at the same time, you know, show some respect to our clients. Thank you for that. Because <laughs> I do know it's something like I think a bit of fashion. Well, I just think it's something people either don't think of or are, or are kind of embarrassed to ask is yeah, yeah. what do you wear as a photographer on site? But I agree with you. It's about respect and, and yeah. just dressing smartly. You know, I don't rock up to shoots wearing heels, but yeah, yeah, neither do I. 
Um, <laughs> For the benefit of people who can't see as well, it's definitely designer stubble. So good work. Yeah, it's designer stubble. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's sort of country road magazine style. <laughs> yeah, the RM Williams stubble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fitting with my real estate. And my wife will be stoked when she hears I got to speak about fashion on, on a podcast. So um, <laughs> she'll laugh. So back to kind of the more probably serious questions. Um, yeah. You've obviously gone through this entire journey now for 13 years, mm-hmm. a lot of ups and downs. You've gone from the struggles of growing a small business starting to now being part of a very large business and team. What would you say the challenges were starting and how you overcame them versus the challenges you're in now? How have those challenges changed? It's a good point. Um, so, there, yeah, there's always been different challenges along the way. I'm trying to think of – so, for example, my biggest challenge is is growth. Um, having a team around me to bring on more work but not spend too much money you know, on growing at the same time and sort of being able to pull the trigger at the right time. But earlier on, it was more um, – I guess it was more before, actually, the biggest problem I had was balancing work, and that's when um, Mindy as a PA came on board, and she was an absolute lifesaver. She is still the best part of my business. I rely on her now. It's Meg, but still under working with Mindy, and they are incredible. So that was – you know, I grew, and then I couldn't keep up sort of you can't turn work away and because it was seasonal, you'd be completely, you know, run off your feet in spring, but then come winter, you had plenty of time on your hands. So you couldn't get that balance right. So Mindy was an absolute lifesaver there. So what does she do for you? <laughs> Sorry to jump in there. My answer is probably too much. <laughs> for those that don't understand, can you explain how it all works with the PAs? So what happens with Mindy and Meg is um, they have access to my – emails both so I have a business email and my not my personal email but my Liam at BWRM email and they monitor them all day and they will action anything they possibly can and if they do need anything they will just text or call me and then this way at the end of the day I will have I'll get over 100 emails during a day but I'll only need to answer 10 of them five of them or whatever it is Uh, we have an office number people call to make bookings and things like that and early on my agents didn't to, you know, just were in bad habits. So I actually, my mates cracked it with me because I would just divert my phone to the office number permanently so that no one could get me between the hours of sort of nine to five. And that meant my agents were forced into the habit of speaking to Mindy to make the bookings and, and make changes or whatever. And she would call me if she needed to talk to me about anything. And it's almost that they assumed that I had to do everything, but they didn't realize that you know, we've got a team behind us and they're the ones that do the, the sort of the heavy lifting or the changing and all that kind of stuff, the change of images and that sort of thing. So I used to sort of never be able to get back to anyone or, you know, it'd be hours before I returned a phone call, whereas now everything is instant thanks to those guys. They're, people will send an email to make a change to a photo and they'll get, a, they'll get that change back sort of half an hour to an hour later versus back in the day, I wouldn't read that email till five o'clock in the afternoon and then try to make that change and, you know, have lost 24 hours of a marketing campaign simply because I couldn't get to an email. So, yeah, so they're the ones, they, they're they like, I, I love what they do. And, um, yeah, I think they're fantastic. I think the other thing I really love about that business is that because Mindy's managing it, you know, you're always going to have staff turnover, but she keeps such up-to-date manuals and, and yep. we've got the same PA managing our stuff that when someone goes on mat leave or something like that, it's all taken care of. We don't need to find someone and retrain yep. them. They've kind of got the manuals. They know what the agent's like. I'm pretty sure it's down to what the agent's dog's name is. Yeah, 100%. It's just these details, which means that transitions are, are taken care of. Yeah, it is. It just takes – it means you can focus on doing what we do best, and that's looking after real estate agents. So wherever um, – Meg can't look after the agent for whatever reason, then it's just a simple call to me. I'll call them back. How can I help you? And what do you need? So they can still get a hold of us, but they now know, most of my agents know that's a Meg call or that's a Liam call. So it depends on what they need. Okay. So managing time was a big challenge yeah. with your growth and you're obviously yep. taking care of that with mm-hmm. PAs and stuff. Are there any other challenges that have come along that you're facing now that you wouldn't have faced when you were a smaller business and just starting to grow? Yeah. Um, so now a big problem for me is, which is always, this has been the problem the whole way through. As soon as I started to grow and had staff, agents needing me on the job, which I'm flattered, but I, I know like some of my team will do better jobs, will do a better job than I am or else they wouldn't be working with us. 
but quite often they're like, no, no, it's got to be Liam. And you're like, okay, cool, that's fine. But I just think perhaps I'm better at selling what I do, um, you know, making the vendor feel more comfortable or whatever it is that they know before we leave the job. They already like our photos, yet they haven't seen them, but they they just think they're in good hands. So I understand that as a business, um, I get that. So I, I try to be there wherever I possibly can. But obviously, at the end of the day, there's only one of me. So um, yeah, we sort of share that around a bit. So how do you manage that when you have an agent that kind of just insists on you? How do you retrain them? Yeah. So uh, it's funny. Um, quite often, it, I, I try to find out why. And often they'll be like, oh, so-and-so did something. And you're kind of laughing because they'll often say something like, oh, there was a leaf in the back corner of the garden and they didn't go pick it up, which I know you would have, but I know full well, I, you know what I mean? They, they've, it's just something they've, they've sort of not imagined, but they've just thought in their own head. So it's kind of like I then just need to chat to that, you know, that staff member and say, hey, they've raised this about you. Let's focus on this. What can I do to help? Are you doing X, Y, Z? And then normally they'll call me one time and say, hey, we need you tomorrow at 12 o'clock and I, I'm not available. So they'll say, fine, we'll use whoever. And then that person will turn up and then after that shoot, they're like, oh, yeah, they're actually all right. So it's that kind of just that trust. They just need to be shown. And just need to, and I understand they need that trust because this is a big listing for them. And if, if the photos aren't correct, the marketing's not correct, they start their listing campaign off on the back foot with the vendor. So if, if they're not getting the price they want, it's obviously because of the photography, not because the vendor's expectations are too high. So if we can remove any of those hurdles in the first place, then the, the agent is very happy, obviously, to start with. I think that's a really big thing that I'm getting from agents at the moment. And it's quite market specific is that. Yeah, there's a lot more pressure on them to get certain prices and they just want to make sure that everything has gone perfectly, that there's yep. no reason that the vendor can have to blame them for, the, for it not getting the price they want. And that's where the customer service at the moment is just so crucial. And that's why we're yep. winning a lot of work. Yeah. It's really based on them knowing they can rely on us. Yeah, exactly right. And yeah, as you said too, it's just being that, that flexibility or whatever they the vendors know we pulled out all the stops. They're confident when we leave. There's nothing, you know, we, we had a great eye for detail and they feel like they're in good hands. So, Liam, I think another thing that's quite not really unique but but interesting about this business is you and I are in neighbouring territories uh-huh. and I know that I've personally benefited from that. But I was wondering if you could just for our listeners talk a little bit about the benefits of working alongside other photographers and having those neighbouring territories. Yes, Jackie, I'll say it's good working next to you too. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> like that, kind of as it came out, it sounded like I was fishing for compliments, but I just think it's it's such a big part of, of what I have is that. No, it is, and it's great because we've both had recently, so for example, with my crazy last couple of months, I've had your team to call on as well. And so it, it just allows us to, you know, we're both generally not flat chat at the same time. We both get busy at the same time, but there's normally one of us is crazy while the other one's just busy. So it means we can have a staff member or two peel off and jump into the other area just for a shoot or two, just for a twilight or whatever, which then eases the pressure. And it is it is mm. great because I'd say the majority of my, my agents know your team as well mm. and trust your team as well. So it just allows us to, when it gets quiet, you know, our teams only work for ourselves. And then when it gets busy, you, you chop and change a bit, which keeps your guys busy and my guys busy and vice mm-hmm. versa. So that's obviously beneficial. It also allows me to, for example, if you work for one and one brand in your area and I know they've got a good relationship with someone, a brand in my area, I can say, hey, here's some work we did with these guys. Like if I'm trying to win their, their client over, and mm. I'm not showing them something from the other side of the country or anything like that. It's like these guys are at one suburb over. I know you know them. Feel free to give them a call and they'll tell you how good we are. So it does it, that sort of support. And, um, and it also allows us too to just give each other a call. How are you going? Are you finding it busy? Mm. Are you finding it quiet? Have you heard this? Have you heard that? Obviously for a bit of gossip as well. But um, yeah, it's always good to sort of, sort of keep your ear to the ground. Presumably also, you know, agents aren't bound by you guys areas so presumably if an agent moves out of jackie's area then she can give you a heads up yep that you know the guys moved into yours and you're straight in there and and it's good from the agent's point of view because they they know the expectations already yep yeah and and we've gotten some pretty good cross referrals there were agents in my territory and they've been agents in liam's territory who've just genuinely referred us to each other's businesses and 
Philip and I go in together and that's gone really well. Yeah, we've got one of our biggest clients has quite a few offices in both of our areas. And so we just cross over there and, and that seems to work really well. So they're getting the same service, yeah. but different people, but same product, same everything else. So they're happy with it. That works really well. Yeah. And I think something that I think we've learned and we've both gotten better at working alongside each other is just our communication. And I think we, we've hit a really nice spot now where we both communicate really well with each other and mm-hmm. we're very kind of collaborative. And I think that's been yeah really beneficial. Yeah, definitely. And it gives you, like, as we said, it's a lonely job that we do. But at the same time, if my business is succeeding, then so is Jackie's and vice versa. When Jackie's, Mm. if Jackie's bringing on clients and they're happy, that's only going to benefit my business. Mm. And at the start too, we were, as we said, we were first on with, with BWRM. We'd turn up, never heard of you. Whereas now I would confidently say everyone in our patch, you know, from Palm Beach all the way through to Lane Cove will have at least heard of us. You know, even if we've never spoken to them, they will have heard of us or seen us or know somebody works with us. So, yeah. So, Liam, for anyone that would want to, that would be looking at getting into this line of work, what advice would you have for them? Are they kind of look at you going, this guy's, you know, doing 160 jobs in a month. This is a big business that he's grown. What advice would you give anyone starting out? Uh, so, if they're already on board, um, I would be... I'd be saying just get out there. So you're going to kind of, you do have to learn, you do have to know the business, you do have to be ready to go. So agents will smell fear. If you rock in there and you don't know what you're doing and whatever, you may blow the job straight away. But once you know what you're doing, they like you to be the professional, I think. They like you to get involved, give your opinion, and at the same time, listen to them. So turn up, find out what they want, find out their sell points, and find out how you can help them get more money next listings, all that kind of stuff. But then also add your flair too. Like like we are creative people. We do have a good eye for what we do. So say, that's awesome. I'll do that shot. But I also think the shot from the other corner, from shot from straight on, whatever, will also do you a favor. So do do that kind of thing as well. So listen to them, do what they want, but then also, you know, do what what you feel is right to best represent that property as well. Their marketing will go up, you know, and then your vendors will be happy and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. What would you say your favourite thing about this job is? Uh, honestly, I would say the hours are pretty good. Um, like I, work, I do work long hours, but I also work for myself, so I understand that that comes with the territory. But I think um, one of the best bits is the flexibility. Like you do work for yourself, so I'm able to, you know, I went to the kids' book parade last week or I coach, you know, a couple of the kids' footy teams um, and that kind of stuff. And I mean, occasionally work gets in the way, but generally speaking, I'm able to make that choice. Um, can we move a job around? And if we can't, well, then I miss it. But generally speaking, I can be present with the family. So I'd have to say that's that's the best bit. It allows me to live a pretty good lifestyle um, and sort of, yeah, still see the kids sometimes. Liam, thank you so much for making the time to join us. I hope you continue to grow. I'm sure you will. It's It's awesome watching it happen and it's really cool having someone so good so close to me so yeah thank you for coming on and thank you for having me i've enjoyed all the podcasts and um hopefully i haven't let you down thanks liam